Where did you get your undergrad? Uh, University of Oregon, okay. uh, uh, go Ducks, uh, and UVA for my master's, Vanderbilt University for my PhD. And when we hear a term like science gap, could you explain what that means? This is similar to um, reading achievement gaps or mathematics achievement gaps. So this is an idea that when we assess children's knowledge about these content areas, how well they read, how well they can do math, how well they can understand science, scientific concepts, whether there seems to be gaps, differences in levels of knowledge, um, particularly uh, between groups that are oftentimes at risk. So low-income children versus high-income children, or English language learners versus non-English language learners, or um, racial and ethnic minorities versus children who are white. And these gaps in reading and mathematics have been uh, uh, well documented and studied, but are less known in science. And there's good evidence that the gaps are quite large in science in the upper elementary, middle, and high school grades. And there's been a concern that if children start to struggle in science, as they might in reading or in mathematics, that they're less likely to become productive citizens, um, experience uh, as, as good employment opportunities, um, and also have the potential of uh, pursuing STEM-related careers that we know are, uh, have good um, stability and tend to be higher paying. And because of these dynamics in terms of by the upper elementary, middle school, high school grades, having some children display lower levels of science achievement, there's been a concern that, that there's a kind of a leaky STEM pipeline that we lose out in terms of uh, human capital and a productive citizenry because children um, uh, aren't as knowledgeable about science as they become adults and so are less likely to pursue STEM-related careers. You had mentioned um, that your research found a large gap. Can you be right. a little bit more specific? And at what age level, what grade level, did you did your researchers start to see that gap? Sure. So typically, these gaps have been studied around um, upper elementary school, like fourth grade, say. And by then, they can be quite large. So um, uh, the way this is typically uh, examined is by looking at um, whether children have grade level mastery of the topic, say in reading and math, math, mathematics or science. In science, the gaps can be quite large between racial and ethnic groups, between low and high income children, um, with, uh, with percentages of, of children who are displaying what's uh, considered below basic levels of proficiency, so not even partial understanding of grade level material. We're talking somewhere in the ballpark of like 50 to 60 percent of children who are black displaying below basic level of proficiency versus much smaller percentages of children who are white. Similarly, for low-income children versus high-income children, the gaps can be quite large. So you're much more likely to be struggling and displaying not even a um, partial grade level mastery of scientific concept by fourth grade. So what we've done was try and understand how early these gaps start to occur. And um, unlike prior research, we started to investigate these gaps beginning in kindergarten. And in our study, um, we examined um, data from children who were assessed starting in kindergarten and as they moved through the elementary and middle school grades, so up until eighth grade. What yardstick did you use to measure? Was there a specific test? In this particular um, sample of children that we analyzed, the way that science achievement was uh, examined was using a general measure of content around physical, um, uh, earth, um, uh, life sciences, and children responded to questions about those different content areas. The test is individually administered and untimed. It's adaptive to the level of proficiency children seem to be displaying. And the test is well designed to study growth over time. So children are assessed with the same type of test, but its content changes as they move from third to fifth to eighth grade in this data set. 
So we have a, a well-designed, psychometrically strong measure of general science achievement that's given in third, fifth, and eighth grade. Uh, in this particular data set, uh, prior to those grade levels, so in kindergarten and first grade, children are assessed using a measure of general knowledge. So this is a mix of items relating to science, um, but also social science. And really the measure is designed to assess children's understanding of, of the general world around them and what they observe. So these are things like uh, um, the seasons, the lunar phases, erosion, but also things like um, what does a fireman do or what do planes and, planes and trains have in common. So it's a measure of sort of general understanding of, of the world or that children can uh, uh, sort of assess and know about in, more informally. So what we find is that um, at kindergarten entry, there are already very large gaps in the level of general knowledge that children have. So for example, um, about if we look at who's scoring in the bottom 25% on this measure of general knowledge, so in other words, 75% of children in the U.S. who took the assessment are scoring higher than these children. So in the bottom 25%, and we, if we look at who is, who, um, who is scoring in that relatively low level of general knowledge, children who are low income are much more likely to display low levels of general knowledge at kindergarten entry. So in our study, it was about 65, almost 70 percent of children who were low income were displaying low le levels of general knowledge versus about 10 percent of high income children. And similarly, we found large gaps among um, racial and ethnic groups and uh, between children who were English language learners and, and non-English language learners. Paul, do researchers know if there's, a, there's an income gap or there's a, a cultural gap? Do, do they know what is going on that, that is causing this gap? Yeah. There's kind of a bad news, good news story here in our study. So um, the bad news is that uh, these gaps start really early and much earlier than uh, perhaps we knew. Um, so it really argues for the, um, uh, the prior to school entry period being very critical in terms of um, laying a foundation for children to be well positioned to learn about science as they progress through um, school. Uh, and these gaps, the other part of the bad news story is these gaps tend to be pretty stable at least currently. So if we look at children who are struggling early on in their knowledge about the general world. Those children who are struggling earlier are very likely to be struggling later in third, fifth, or eighth grade. So in our study, a majority of the children who were scoring very low on the assessment in the fall of kindergarten were, were displaying a very low level of performance uh, on a general measure of science achievement in third or fifth or eighth grade. So the gaps start early and remain stable. The good news part of our study is that we can explain these gaps. Uh, and so if we look at the gap in general knowledge between, or in science, between um, children who are black and children who are white, we can explain about 75 to 80 percent of that gap because of, of factors that are occurring um, during the primary grades or before. Similarly, between low income and high income children, we can explain about 95, almost 100 percent of the gap. What are these things that explain the gap? Um, it's the level of understanding you have about the general world before you come into kindergarten. It's how well a reader you are, how well, uh, 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 how much you know about mathematics, um, uh, how well you uh, display good behavioral self-regulation, task persistence, atten attention to the teacher's instruction. So these factors which are largely modifiable through policies that we can adopt as well as parenting practices that we might engage in can really help close these gaps and better position children who might be otherwise at risk to grow up to experience more opportunity educationally and societally. Let's talk about the, the, the parenting. What can parents do? I think some, th some things that parents can do uh, uh, sort of on the, f on the front end in particular um, uh, but also in the back end as children age is, is a couple of things. One of which is it, it's, it's remembering to expose children to learning opportunities that might relate to science. So what are some examples? So oftentimes when uh, we take kids to the library, we might be picking up 
um, fairy tales and stories about unicorns and rainbows a lot more than we're picking up stories about dinosaurs and castles and construction. So um, pri trying to provide children with um, uh, nonfiction text that helps provide them with exposure to knowledge and concepts that then relate to science. Um, so one th easy thing that parents can do is to try and expose their children on occasion to uh, informational related text with, through storybook reading. Um, uh, pointing out uh, uh, things that are occurring in the children's general surroundings. Um, extending their knowledge about different phenomenon. Um, so, what, so an example when you when you when you pass a construction site and the child's asking, <coughs> you know, what are those? Not only pointing out that that's a dump truck or that's a skid steer, but also saying what they do and why they're doing it. They're excavating, they're digging out um, dirt and they're putting down pipe and these pipes run underground under the street and connect our homes and it's the reason that in our house when I turn on the faucet water is flowing through is because of the pipes that this these uh, this construction tr crew is is um, putting together um, similarly about rain if it's raining outside extending the child's understanding of, of rain and wh where it fits in within the water cycle and the rain comes down and it helps um, the plants grow and um, the animals that uh, uh, often feed on those plants, but also w after the rain's been there for a while and the sun comes out, it starts to evaporate and return back up to the atmosphere. So explaining and trying to extend informally children's observation and understanding about phenomenon around them, I think can be helpful. Um, some of the things to do uh, early but also later is, is try, and, try and model the behaviors that you'd want your children to uh, engage in. Um, so, uh, what are these things in science? These are things like um, using investigation and observation and questioning and evidence and hypothesis generation and testing. So, um, uh, uh, asking about how the children's the, the child's doing in science when they're in eighth grade, right? Or um, um, talking about science-related topics that you see in the newspaper over dinner. Um, when children are asking about something or sharing something about an observation in the social or, or kind of the scientific world, asking them to extend upon that, asking them questions. Um, um, you know, what are your observations? Why do you think that is? What can we do to test whether that's true? Uh, so modeling through your own interactions um, the type of critical thinking skills and um, tools that scientists use in everyday matter uh, in everyday matters and also showing interest and enthusiasm and in, in that it's important to you as a parent I think can really help children whether they're younger or older uh, uh, maintain a productive disposition towards uh, science math and other um, stem related fields can teachers help make up the gap is yeah. there anything teachers right. can do and what sure. about policymakers well, it's never too late to help a child. So um, even though the gaps start early and persist, that doesn't mean for a teacher that children in your class um, who you may think are behind or are struggling, it's never too late to help them. Um, and some of the things that we, the teachers can do is uh, help provide opportunities to learn about science. Right now, science instruction and opportunities to learn about science in schools has been in decline. Um, uh, providing opportunities for meaningful experimentation uh, and also making sure that the ways that children are being taught, especially children who are at risk or struggling, um, that the ways that they're being taught in terms of reading instruction or mathematic instruction has good empirical evidence and support for it and are not just a collection of curriculum that are ad hoc and don't have any evidence to support their use. There's been a good amount of work by the Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, to help validate um, curriculums in reading and mathematics in particular, uh, uh, as well as other kind of interventions in terms of children's behavior that can really help position students to be much more successful academically. And schools should be using those. 
uh, in terms of policymakers, um, uh, you, you know, there's this idea of science achievement gaps and declining scientific literacy has really been a cause of concern for a number of years. And in fact, there have been uh, two National Research Council reports regarding our declining economic competitiveness, in part because of, of lower levels of scientific literacy and a declining proportion of the, of the population that's interested in STEM-related careers. And so the most recent expert panel report in regard to this uh, it, it, it talks about the nation facing a, a storm, a rapidly approaching a Category 5 in terms of the seriousness of, of these conditions leading to declining economic competitiveness of the country. So what policymakers can do is realize, at least from our study, is that um, the dynamics of declining uh, interest in matters related to science for children probably start pretty young. Uh, so, you know, by 10, 11, 12, it, uh, children may be looking at science and math as things that are sort of fixed abilities and things that smart kids do but I don't do. And what can happen at that point is those children can move away from um, uh, uh, academic content relating to math and science that they may be very well have the capacity to do and but as a result because of looking at it as hard or somehow disengaging um, they lose interest and we lose out as a country as, as a result so much of these dynamics in regards to interest in STEM related fields um, I think begin pretty early and the foundation in which we can set for increasing the likelihood that children are, grow up to be scientific literate, scientifically literate and also may be interested in STEM related fields really starts prior to school entry and pretty soon into school. But yet we haven't really designed or have much of a set of policies that are well positioned to ensure that children are growing up to be uh, uh, interested in STEM-related careers. Is it too late to bridge that gap to catch up once a child hits ninth grade, eighth grade? Is there a time when it's, it's too well, late? I never want to say it's too late, okay? Um, it's, it's never too late to help a child, just like it's never too late to help someone who might be sick, right? It's never too late to try and put out a house fire. Um, it's, it, but it's a lot easier to help someone from um, dying <laughs> or it's a lot easier to keep the house from burning down if we direct our efforts early on, right, to provide a lot of prevention-oriented care, to um, pour the glass of water on the cigarette that's been dropped on the carpet before we wait for the whole building to be on fire. So it's never too late to help. But our efforts to help can be much more productive and uh, uh, much, make much more of an impact if we direct them in certain ways. And early seems to me much more helpful than late. You know, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men, as Frederick Douglass said. And uh, that's true. I think if we direct our efforts early on, um, uh, just like we have learned to do in regards to, to reading instruction, and I think are learning more and more in regards to math instruction, it also seems to be the case that if we can help children early on um, to be successful when they're first learning about science, I think they'll be much better positioned as they age to grow up to be productive citizens. Most people, I assume, know what the STEM careers are. Could you name some of the careers that our children might be missing out on because they're not as well versed in science. Sure. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so what are careers that in, in, involve this? So engineers, um, mathematicians, um, uh, 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 people who are ex um, geneticists or uh, looking at bio the biological sciences in some way. And I guess it's important to say, you know, it's 
I'm trying to emphasize sort of two things, Cindy. Um, there, uh, one of which is it's good for our country if we have children who grow up to be scientifically literate, mm -hmm. because the you know globally the world is becoming more advanced scientifically. There's more technological or scientifically related uh, issues that are emerging. Climate change, you know, cloning. Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the different ways that we might affect um, uh, uh, human um, uh, human health. Uh, it, so knowing about science and being able to think scientifically, investigate, observe, ask questions, evaluate evidence, uh, is very helpful in terms of uh, educated citizenry. So that's one thing, and then the but the other thing is is that um, there's an increasing demand globally for those who are sort of well trained in the STEM fields, and we have a big pipeline every year of children who are moving through our schools, but we have a lot of drop off in terms of the of 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 who eventually becomes um, employed at the STEM side of things, post-secondary school. So it's like, you know, of the kids who s move through our K through 12 schools, you're looking at about three or four percent end up becoming employed um, in a STEM-related field. But we know those jobs are very important in terms of our economic competitiveness. And there's a lot of things they bring as advantages to the individual. So you, um, uh, you have better employment possibilities. Those positions are high paying, they're in demand, so you have more stability. Um, and so there's sort of two dynamics that I'm trying to emphasize, one of which is globally it's good for kids to grow up to be scientifically literate and to think like a scientist, um, observe, ask questions, evaluate evidence, these things. But it's also good if not every kid's going to grow up to be like this, and my, uh, you know, I didn't <laughs> in terms of a STEM. You didn't, um, uh, but for those kids who could grow up, we don't want to fail them by um, not supporting their c potentials and capacities early on. And when those kids who have that capacity are growing up in um, poor households, and their parents aren't knowledgeable or able to foster their interests. And then they go to schools that are um, economically disadvantaged and their interests aren't supported. Um, pretty early on, we're probably losing out as a country in terms of those kids growing up to be, you know, a, a scientist that represents the U.S. in terms of un, uh, understanding phenomenon and contributing to a, 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 um, a more advanced society, and that's that's we're leaving a lot of talent. Uh, a lot of talent is spilling off the table as a result, and that's a tragedy. So, our study helps. I think it tries to showcase or or shine a spotlight on that these dynamics start pretty early in children's development.